it's really the the gospel is really the subject of the whole Bible, so um, it's a very large subject. So tonight I'm going to put quite a lot of uh, quotes up on the screen for you. You won't need to turn very many quotes up because we've got quite a lot um, of material to get through. Now I don't want to spend too much time talking about um, the problems in today's world as such. We know there's a lot of tension around um, conflicts in the Middle East. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about the coronavirus and other things. We're all to a greater or lesser degree aware of many of the problems and the enormous uncertainty which is facing the world. And I'm sure we're all aware that life as we know it can't go on forever like it is. Uh, the, the earth just can't sustain the society and the environment that man has brought upon this earth. We're consuming vast amounts of resources. Um, the world just cannot keep up. Um, the, the food consumption, the food production is just not happening. The world can't sustain a man as uh, we are currently living. The pollution, there's wars going on, there's environmental debates. Um, cl is climate change happening? Is it our fault? Is it just a natural course um, of events? But for the majority, there's far too much short-term gain at stake to do uh, very much about these things. Yes, there's people who are trying to implement changes, trying to cut down on fossil fuel emissions and such like, but in our Western society particularly, um, we, are, we are used to a, a way of life which can't really change that much without some huge amounts of change which will cut down the way we live, the, thing, the way we do things, why we do things, the, the uh, fuel and the resources that we consume. There's the gender debate that goes on. There's inequality, there's poverty, there's violence and crime. There's the virus that is uh, forefront of lots of people's minds. And just the huge amount of numbers of people that are being infected in India. Uh, just for example, in four or five days, the entire population of South Australia would be infected at the rate that it's happening in, in India. That's quite staggering. Countries are struggling to control the spread of that disease. And people are trying to uh, create vaccines, but there's a lot of uncertainty about that as well. Um, is it going to work? Is it going to be effective? Is it going to um, cause this virus to come to a halt? We actually don't know. There's a huge amount of problems facing our world and we're not going to uh, talk too much more about it. But I'd like to begin with by looking at uh, two Bible quotes which essentially show the two extremes that um, the vast majority of people on this earth um, would tend towards one or the other. So the first quote is from Luke 21, verse 25 and 26. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. It's describing great turmoil among the nations. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things that are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven are shall be shaken. People are very, very worried about what's going to happen to our planet, to the earth, to the society that we have created. And at the other end of the spectrum, Matthew 24, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, for as in the days that were before the flood, and he's talking about the time of Noah, which you may or may not be aware of, but in those days people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. They knew not until the flood came and took them all away, and so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. People were just carrying on with their normal daily living. They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage and all those legitimate activities which people do with really no thought or no care. What's going to happen in the future? I'm not really interested. I'm just interested in... What is happening right now? Am I enjoying myself? So we have the two extremes, 
of, of thought generally in our world. People, some are very worried, some people actually don't care. As long as I'm happy, as long as I'm enjoying myself, it's all good. Now we've said tonight that the gospel is good news. You may know a little bit about the gospel, you may know nothing. Um, wherever you fall, uh, we can all learn something tonight, hopefully. We all enjoy good news, don't we? Has our football team won? Petrol prices have gone down. Um, there's a new vaccine being developed. The lockdown has been lifted. That's all good news, isn't it? It's how we look at things. Some people will look at an event and think that's good news. Some people will look at an event and think, well, that's not actually very good news. But we've said the gospel is good news. And as we hope to show tonight, it's good news for anybody that will respond to what God has offered in the pages of the Bible. There's bad news everywhere, especially if we go looking for it, isn't it? In the papers, online, on the TV, wherever we look, there's always bad news. And that's not what we want to talk about. We want to talk about good news. So what is the good news? Let's talk about it. The New Testament of the Bible was originally written in the Greek language. And the word gospel simply means, means a good message. A good, new, good news or a good message about what? Well, this verse in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17 tells us, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's something to do with Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now there's a word in there, or possibly some words, but one word particularly that we may not be familiar with and that's the word salvation. It simply means saved. So if we put those thoughts together, the gospel of Christ has the power to save people. That's what that verse is telling us. To the Jew first, it's been offered, and then to the Gentile, also to the Greek. Now that's a Bible term. Um, you might come across Greeks or Gentiles. It's essentially saying anyone who is a non-Jew. So the gospel has been offered to whoever wants to take notice of what God has written. Verse 17, for therein, that is in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, faith is another Bible word, um, not exclusive to the Bible, obviously, but it describes someone who has a confidence in something in the future, something that is going to happen, but it's in the future. Let's look at the... I've put there in yellow in a, a translation of the same verses in, from Romans chapter 1. For I have complete confidence in the gospel... It is God's power to save all who believe, first the Jews and also the Gentiles. For the gospel reveals how God puts people right with himself. It is through faith from beginning to end, as the scripture says, the person who is put right with God through faith shall live. So the gospel is offering us life. Our world is full of death, isn't it? There's a lot of evidence around us that death happens. Let's look at this verse from Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes was written by a man who was the ruler of the world. He had all the money he wanted at his disposal. He could buy whatever he wanted. He could build whatever he wanted. And he did it. He wrote the book of Ecclesiastes talking about this experiment that he conducted if he wanted something, he bought it. He built um, great buildings, planted gardens and orchards. He did everything he wanted. And this is what he discovered. We'll, we'll look at Ecclesiastes again later in our session. But in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5, he says, The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, 
for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a, a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So he's saying that whatever you do with your life, however rich you might become, you will die. And I don't think that's news to anybody. There's, is there anything beyond death? Well, we believe there is, and that's what we hope to share with you tonight. But he says, as I've highlighted there in, in yellow, neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So when someone dies, there is no more existence. There's no more life. There's nothing. Unless you understand and accept the offer that God has made to all of us. And that is what the gospel has the power to save us from. If you remember back to the verses we looked at just, pro just previously in Romans chapter 1, it is the power of God unto salvation. It's saving us. The gospel has power to save us from death. And that's what we would like to share with you tonight. It doesn't mean that you will never die. And that's another idea that we need to explore. But it's the type of death that happens because there's a type of death here that's described in Ecclesiastes where that's it there's nothing else but the Bible talks about another kind of death where God has said that he can bring people back to life to bring them to live again in the kingdom that he will establish on this earth Mark chapter 16, uh, verse 15 and 16, a couple of, couple of verses. Uh, these are the words of Jesus. He said un Jesus said unto them, or his disciples, he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. There's that word again, saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. So again, we have confirmed by the Lord Jesus Christ that the gospel has the power to save people. And that's exactly what we want to share with you. We have a choice, don't we, all of us? Are we going to believe? Are we going to accept what God has presented to us? And if we do, we have that offer of being saved. But if we choose not to accept God's offer, then as Ecclesiastes said, verse 9, or chapter 9, um, there's nothing else. Life ends, death claims us, and there is no future for those who don't believe what God has offered. So we all have a choice. What are we going to choose? Okay, let's look at another verse in the book of Acts. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus said to his disciples, go and preach the gospel. And the book of Acts, which is the fifth book in the New Testament, is really the story or the beginning of the story of Jesus' disciples preaching the gospel, going out into the then known world and spreading the gospel, the good news, the fact that God could actually save people. So in Acts chapter 8, verse 12, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. So here, instead of... We, we could actually put the gospel in there. When they believed Philip preaching the gospel, they were baptised, both men and women, because Jesus had told his disciples to go and preach the gospel. And here we have Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. So we would suggest that the, the gospel is actually made up of two distinct parts, but very much related to each other. The things concerning the kingdom of God and the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ. And if you remember back to the verse we looked at in, at the beginning in Romans chapter 1, 
where Paul, the man Paul, who was the writer of Romans, said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it has the power to save all who believe. So the, th the, the name of Jesus Christ, there's something very special about the name of Jesus Christ because it has power. It is part of the gospel. It has power to save us. So we're going to spend a few moments exploring this idea, the second part, firstly, about the name of Jesus Christ. What does that mean and what can it do? How does it relate to the gospel? All right, let's look at another, another quote. Uh, Acts chapter 4 and... Did I skip? No. Acts chapter 4, verse 10 to 12. In this story, there was a man who was... Uh, he was... Uh, sorry. He was blind, I think, or lame. I just can't quite remember. But uh, he, was, he was healed. Can anyone help me out? Lame. He was lame. I think he was lame. Yes, that's right. Sorry about that. But he had been uh, made whole again by the power of the Holy Spirit or the power that God had given to the disciples to go out and preach the gospel. And the disciples are talking to the onlookers after this man had been presented whole or healed. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a while, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. This is the stone, and in effect he's saying Jesus Christ was set at naught. He was, he was actually crucified. They counted him as nothing. They wanted nothing to do with him. That's why they killed him. But it was because of Jesus Christ by the power of Jesus Christ, that this man was healed. Verse 12, Neither is there salvation, or being saved again, in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus Christ, or belief in Jesus Christ, is the only name that has the power to save us from death. There's nothing else that can save us. And that's the only reason why this man was healed from his sickness. It was through the name of Jesus Christ. Romans 5 verse 10. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, so Jesus Christ was crucified as many of us would be aware, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So when Jesus Christ was crucified, there was a special work accomplished because he was a sinless man. He had never failed in what God asked him to do. But this verse tells us, even above that, we shall be saved by his life. Now there's something very special about the life of of Jesus Christ. What was it about the life of Jesus Christ which was very special? He didn't sin, and that's impossible for all of us. If we, we aren't aware of what sin is, it is essentially doing anything against God. Something that God has required of us and we fail to do or sometimes we know what God wants us to do and we deliberately choose not to do those things. That's sin. But Jesus Christ never sinned because he always did exactly what God required of him. And he said that. I came to earth not to do my own thing. I didn't come here to do my own will or my own desires. I came here to do what God wanted me to do. And he did that perfectly. And he asks us to make those same choices and do what God asks of us. So we can be saved by the life of Jesus Christ. Now, what does that actually mean? Do we need to 
do nothing? Can we just, oh, well, Jesus has died and we're saved by his, by his life? Well, no, he, he gives us specific instructions about what we need to do. Jesus said to all the people who were listening, if any man come after me, if anyone wants to understand my way of life, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Now there's three specific things in those verses that he asks us to do. Deny self. Now that simply means don't always do what you want to do. We all, we all do, don't we? we? We often look after ourselves. We make choices which will protect ourselves or be best for us. But Jesus says, it's not actually about you, it's about God. We need to take up our cross daily. Now, a cross isn't a pleasant thing. But there's things in life sometimes which are very difficult or very hard for us to do. And Jesus is saying... I want you to actually understand what it's like to sometimes make choices which are hard or difficult. We don't always want to do the easy thing. We don't always want to do what God wants us to do. But he says to us we need to take up our cross daily and follow me, he says. And that just doesn't mean... You know, meandering along a bit aimlessly. It means a deliberate following. There's, there's something there which I'm specifically, I've got my eyes focused on that thing and I'm following it. And Jesus wants us to follow him in the same way. Not just, you know, just well, wandering along and looking around. He wants us to have our eyes focused on him and his life and deliberately make a choice every day to follow him and un try to understand his way of life and why he did what he did. Let's just look at this next verse in Romans chapter 8 and verse 13 and 14 along similar lines. If you live after the flesh... And that's a Bible term or Bible description of saying, if you don't actually care what God says and you just please yourself and do whatever you like to do, you will die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify or put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So if we make a deliberate choice many, many times a day, I'm not going to do what I want to do, I'm going to make a choice for God. And if we make that a way of life or a habit, we will live. And that idea comes up again, doesn't it? Being saved, being, being made alive again or living. And that's what the Bible is offering to us. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We can become related to God if we make deliberate choice every day to do what God uh, desires of us. Look at these couple of verses just describing to us God actually wants us to be in the kingdom and we're going to talk a little bit about the kingdom because it's the second part of the gospel if you remember back to Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. The things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. So just these two verses. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He's talking to people who have made a deliberate choice in their lives to serve God, to understand God, to follow Jesus Christ in the things that he did, in the choices he made. And Luke chapter 12 and verse 32, again the words of Jesus. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God wants us in this kingdom, whatever that might be, and we're going to talk a little bit further about that. But God actually wants to save people. He loves it when people make choices for him. He loves it when people try to understand his ways and why he does things. He loves that and he wants people to be in his kingdom. 
All right, I'd like to just spend a little bit of time um, in the Old Testament um, talking a bit more about the kingdom of God. God has prepared something much better than what we see around us. His kingdom that's going to come to this earth is going to be much better than what we see around us. There'll be no coronavirus. There'll be no petrol prices going up and down. All of those things that some, sometimes cause us great stress, none of that will be a part of the kingdom of God. The book of Daniel chapter, chapter 2 in the Old Testament describes a dream which was had by the the king of Babylon at the time, about 600 BC, his name was Nebuchadnezzar. He had a nightmare and he saw a huge image made up of different metals, the head made out of gold, the chest and arms of silver, the belly and thighs of brass, the legs made out of iron and the feet made out of a mixture of iron and clay. And he wanted to understand what this actually meant. It was a very confusing dream. And the man Daniel describes to Nebuchadnezzar what he saw in his dream because Nebuchadnezzar actually wanted someone to tell him what he had seen. So Daniel says to him, you saw, Nebuchadnezzar, you saw a stone was cut out without hands and it smote the image on the feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And I'd like you to take specific note of these words in yellow. The stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So Nebuchadnezzar had seen this great image standing up and a, a stone came out of nowhere, really. It destroyed the image and ground it to powder. Everything was blown away except the stone. The stone remained, and it grew and grew and grew into a great mountain until it filled the earth. What does that mean? Well, later on in the chapter, uh, Daniel describes the meaning of the dream, and he says this. In the days of these kings, he describes how this image that Nebuchadnezzar had seen, the gold and the silver and the brass and iron, all represented the kingdoms or the governments of man. And he says, the governments of man shall the, sorry, in the days of these kings or the governments, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. So if we think to the the story of what or the picture of what Nebuchadnezzar had seen. He'd seen this stone come out and destroy the image and grow into a great mountain and fill the earth. So the God of heaven and his kingdom is represented by the stone because it comes and destroys the governments, the society, the culture that man has placed upon this earth. It replaces those things. The kingdom shall not be left to other people. It, shall not be, it will not be left to just anyone to take over. God will put a specific person in charge of his kingdom. And it will break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. The kingdom of God, the kingdom that God plans to put on this earth will replace everything we see around us at the moment. All the governments, all the ruling powers will be gone and it will be replaced by the kingdom of God with our Lord Jesus Christ as king. Obviously, a kingdom needs a king, doesn't it? Jesus Christ is that king. Let's look at, verse, at um, Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, we have a description of an angel coming to a young woman by the name of Mary who was going to be the mother of Jesus Christ. And this is the message the, the angel gave to Mary. The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. God had specifically chosen this young woman because of her character, because of the qualities she had. 
to be the mother of Jesus Christ. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. It's really a picture of that stone coming and smashing the image and grinding it to powder. The kingdom of God is going to replace everything that we see around us. And our Lord Jesus Christ, as king over the kingdom of God, will replace the governments of this earth. There's a lot of corruption, a lot of deceit, a lot of oppression that happens, not particularly in our country, but in other parts of the world. And that's all going to be replaced by the rule of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. So the gospel is in two parts. The kingdom of God, the things concerning the kingdom of God. We know about the kingdom of God. It's going to replace the things that we see around us at the moment. And Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus Christ, belief in his name and trying to follow our Lord Jesus Christ will give us salvation. It will save us so we all can be a part of the kingdom of God. That's the gospel. Is the gospel just a New Testament idea? Is it, is it in the Old Testament as well? Well, it is because this verse in Galatians chapter 3 says, The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith or the, the nations preached before or previously preached the gospel to Abraham. And Abraham was a, a character in the Old Testament. At the very beginning, almost, of the Old Testament. But the gospel was preached to him, saying, in thee, sorry, there's a spelling error, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, Abraham lived 4,000 years ago. So how is that going to happen? How is the promise that God has made to Abraham going to be fulfilled? Genesis 17, this is the, one of the promises that God made to Abraham. I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land where thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, or the land that we currently see as Israel, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now, if Abraham died 4,000 years ago, how can the promise of God be fulfilled? How can God keep that promise to Abraham that he would give Abraham the land for an everlasting possession well there's really only one way Abraham died 4,000 years ago but God has the power to bring people back to life we've seen that we can read about a number of occasions in the Bible where God has had God has done that for people. Our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. God brought him back to life. There's a number of other occasions, another, a number of other instances where people were brought back to life again. And if God has the power to do that for those people, he can do that for any one of us. Let's look at this verse in John chapter 11. This was... In John chapter 11, a man by the name of Lazarus died and Jesus brought him back to life. No one believed that he could do it, but he did. And this is what he said to one of, La one of the sisters of Lazarus. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now, we might find that really difficult to believe. But Jesus is very clear, isn't he? He says, I have the power to raise people from the dead, to bring them back to life. Even though they are dead, they can live again. And that's how the promise that God has made to Abraham can be fulfilled. If God chooses to bring Abraham back to life, 
and give him the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. God can do that for any one of us. In the book of Acts, a man by the name of Paul, who we've mentioned before, says he's having a discussion with someone about the gospel and he says, why should it be thought a thing incredible, I think that's supposed to be to you, that God should raise the dead? Do you think it's really impossible for God to raise the dead? He's done it before and he can do it again. He can do it for any one of us. He that believes in Jesus Christ, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That's a challenge for all of us, isn't it? We may not yet fully comprehend what that means or understand the mechanics of how that happen, can happen. We don't need to. We just need to have, to, to have faith. The name of Jesus Christ, if we believe in that name, if we believe in the life of Jesus Christ and try to follow him, we can be brought back to life if we die and God can give us the kingdom of, give us a part in his kingdom. These verses from 2nd of Timothy. God has saved us and called us with an holy calling not according to our works, because, as we've already talked about, we sometimes make decisions, sometimes make choices which are not right before God. But according to God's own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, and that really means rendered death powerless, even if we die, it actually means nothing because God can bring us back to life again. He's brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes, which we looked at the beginning. These are the words of Solomon again, a man who had tried everything. He'd experimented with everything and at the end, there was really no lasting satisfaction. The richest man on the, on the planet at the time had the wealth of the world at his fingertips and yet he found no satisfaction in that. One generation passeth away and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth and the sun goeth down and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south and turneth away to the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labour, man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. You know, life is just a big cycle, isn't it? The sun we know that the sun doesn't go round the earth, the earth goes round the sun. But every day the sun comes up, goes across the sky and goes down and it does the same thing tomorrow and the same thing the day after. All the rivers run into the sea, but the sea's never full. Why? Because the water evaporates and goes up to the clouds and it rains and runs down the rivers and into the sea. And that's exactly what life is like for most of us. It's just a cycle. We are born... Man born, sorry, men are born, men and women are born and they live life and then they die and another cycle begins and over and over and over again. Well, God has offered us something which can actually break that cycle. Yes, we might die, but we can live again. Right at the end of Ecclesiastes, Solomon said this, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's, that's the pinnacle of what people can do. Fear God and keep his commandments. We can have all the wealth in the world, but it actually means nothing because God wants us to fear him and keep his commandments. All right, sorry, we're nearly, nearly there. In Isaiah chapter 55, it's a, 
the first three verses of a very similar idea to what we've just read in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The man Isaiah is calling to people and saying, Are you a bit weary of life? Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye. And sorry, that's meant to say buy and eat. Um, sorry, there's a, a bit of a grammatical error there. Um, I can just read it for you if you like. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore ye do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labour that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and ye, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. So particularly verse 2. You know, we can spend our whole life trying to get money. What for? Just to eat, so that we can live a bit longer, so that we can make some more money, so we can buy food, so we can live a bit longer. And the cycle of life just goes on and on. And Isaiah says, are you happy with that? Are you satisfied with that kind of life? Because I can offer you something much, much greater. And the gospel gives us that hope, doesn't it? It offers us something much greater than just the cycle of life. Eternal life in the kingdom of God. That's what the hope of the gospel is. I was going to talk a little bit about the kingdom of God, but I think we've gone on long enough. Um, but just a couple of verses. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. There's many, many verses in the Bible which talk about what the kingdom is going to be like, but that's a wonderful summary of what the kingdom entails. There'll be no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying. And there's a lot of that in our world, isn't it? But that will be all gone when the kingdom of God is established on the earth. What a, what a wonderful hope the gospel has given to us. What God has given to us through the work of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Chapter 11 of Hebrews is a list of names of people who have lived and died but had faith in the gospel had faith that God could raise them to life again and they lived their life trying to follow Jesus Christ. These all having obtained a good report through faith and what is faith? It's a belief in something that actually hasn't happened yet. These people believed in something, something in the future, the kingdom of God. But they didn't receive any promises because they're all dead. But God has provided some better thing for us. He's, he's offered us something much greater than what life can offer us at the moment. That they, those people, all those people catalogued in Hebrews chapter 11 and many, many thousands of others will be raised to life again. And we have that opportunity as well. That they without us should not be made perfect. So we can be together with that with a huge group of people who have had a faith in God that God will do what he says, that he can bring people back from the dead, that he will establish a kingdom which will replace all the sadness and all the sorrow. And all the difficulties, 
that life gives us. We thank our God for what he's offered. And it's up to each one of us to make a choice and we have that opportunity. Thank you.